All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Deering Live. Uh, this week, we have Jake Sheps, um, an extremely creative, uh, creative musician and banjoist that has brings the banjo into a lot of different a lot of different spaces um and and he's involved in not just playing the instrument but a lot of different uh other aspects be it uh his his camp banjo summit or or some tab books coming out so there's a lot going on and a lot to talk about so without uh further ado let's let's bring jake in hey jake how you doing good how are you Good to see you. Doing great. Yeah, good to see you again. Do you want to kind of kick us off and play a tune? Sure, I will. Um, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna follow the tradition of BB Bounis, who was on the on this um, a month or two ago, and she started with one of Adam Larrabee's preludes, and uh, so I learned I learned one of his preludes. It's this is the E major prelude, and I combined it with a tune that I wrote. So here we go. Fantastic. <laughs> With Adam a lot, don't you? I do. I'm in the middle of a really cool project with Adam. Um, well, I I run an I run a 501c3 called the Round Window Institute, and it does a handful of different projects. One of which is the Banjo Summit. And during the pandemic, we kind of got this idea of launching a book press of banjo transcriptions. And so Adam is on the board of the Round Window Institute, and he's kind of a regular feature at Banjo Summit camps. And then additionally, um, he's an, he has an amazing ear and he's a great transcriber. So he, we started with, uh, we're working on a Wes Corbett transcription book of his album Cascade, which I think Wes mm -hmm. has been on this, yeah, um, yeah. this as well. And, uh, and Adam, it, um, we're going to republish the prelude books as well, but Adam and I have been kind of working on these books and the big kind of big project that we're currently on we're putting the final touches on wes's book and the next project is bela flex uh, new my bluegrass heart tab book which is right. an epic tome as you might as you might imagine so tell us more about this round window institute what's where'd kind of the idea from it all come about and what's it what's kind of the general What's the kind of general mission statement of, of it, or, or how would sure. you describe it? Um, well, it's funny. We're actually due to write a real mission statement, but we, <laughs> we have, uh, <laughs> uh, like most nonprofits have, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so the round window is the banjo, and I stole the name from, um, there's this great uh, Irish, Irish album. I'm actually drawing a blank on the guy's name, which it was, it's called Through the Round Window. It's mm -hmm. a great tenor banjo album. And, I swiped, swiped that and uh, founded the Round Window Institute, of which I think of the banjo as this window for me to kind of look out into the greater musical world, as well as I think the banjo is this incredible, there's just, there's so much to the banjo and um, in its history as this iconic American instrument. While it comes from Africa and it's an ancient instrument and it's been, there's versions of the banjo all over the world, 
is basically a stick with strings on it and a drum. But uh, this version is so American and a lot of the music that comes out of it. So um, it's this view into this extraordinary. So I see it, the window kind of going both ways. We founded the nonprofit about um, maybe three or four years ago and have been running Banjo Summit, this camp that was we ran live in Fort Collins for a few years and just ran, I think it's the fifth or sixth, and then we moved it online during the pandemic. And so Banjo Summit is kind of an intermediate and up banjo camp. I wanted to create a banjo camp for me. Like, I think there's a lot of people who have kind of graduated, who are very good players and have graduated from a lot of the more introductory camps and want to continue to study the instrument. And as an eternal student myself, I'd, um, I found out a camp that I wanted to go to and hired faculty that I wanted to study with. And uh, <laughs> That's awesome. so, so, um, so I would say, I say it's intermediate and up. Um, we've had beginners come to the camp and certainly the online camp, they've, they seem to have gotten a lot. So it is for all levels, but there's not just fundamental technique of how to put on your picks, but it's really like once you have some technique of like, here's where music begins. And so we have classes on everything from world music to odd meters to um, jazz harmony to, um, you know, really kind of creative invention of like how to use roles in creative ways and, um, improvisation and playing free we've done this huge spectrum of different um like all sorts of right creative um s different kind of methods of single string playing whether it's three finger or two finger and stuff like that so that was what round window institute was kind of founded to run the banjo summit we're running a mandolin camp actually in about three weeks called the modern mandolin workshop because um the great mike marshall took the name mandolin summit which uh <laughs> <laughs> is okay because he deserves it. And he's actually going to be faculty at this one coming up. Um, but it was basically part of it was a bunch, um, part of the, this also was true for Banjo Summit. It's like there's a bunch of progressive players, myself included, that would often be hired to these camps to be the kind of one guy who's teaching alternative stuff and then the rest of everybody else teaching much more traditional things. And my idea was like, well, let's take all those one, those guys and gals and put them all together in one camp. And so the same we're doing with the mandolin camp with people like Dominic Leslie and Jake Jolliffe and Maddie Whitler, these real kind of progressive and uh, David Benedict. So mandolin camp runs in a few weeks. We're going to do a Shoro camp, which is probably going to be live. The mandolin camp is online. Um, Shoro, this Brazilian music that I love. And then we're launching the, uh, the round window press to do transcription books. And uh, we have a few in the pipeline, and our pipeline is moving a little slow right now as we get it off the ground, but West Corbett's Cascade will be book number one, and Bela's My Bluegrass Heart is book number two. We'll have the Adam Larrabee Prelude books will be coming out, and uh, something from Max Allard, a uh, uh, young phenom from Chicago, has a new record coming out that's just beautiful solo banjo. And uh, so... Those will be coming out sometime and probably some of those in 2022. Nice. And, and so um, where can where can somebody go to for, for first Banjo Summit? Is there is there a URL? Sure, absolutely. Oh, and I kind of failed to mention our sure. mission statement. <laughs> I got <laughs> tied up in our things. Sure. But um, I would say our mission state, like we really have what I would say are four planks. And it's like it's um, it's new music, it's technique and musicianship, new music and tradition are kind of the various things that we focus on. And sometimes those are focused on by one faculty member in one class, or sometimes it could be spread out amongst several. We do have another online banjo summit coming up in February, of which um, we've not, we're about to open enrollment. But if you go to banjosummit.org is where you can find out all the information. And one of the things that we've done with the online the online camp has been, I would say, an extraordinary success. Like I really, there's nothing like being live and interacting with people, but um, and you know, those kind of hallway moments in between, it's like, hey, what was, you know, what was Wes Corbett talking about here? And just finding out information from, and just getting to kind of hang out with other banjo players. But uh, yeah. online has provided us 
so many, I mean, we had over a hundred people at the, um, at, we ran one last December and then in May, and we had a hundred people from over, I mean, actually between the two, I think there's like about 150 people at the, between the two camps from about 15 different countries, people who would unlikely make it to Fort Collins, Colorado, where we've been traditionally running it. Um, and what the, we do it on Zoom webinar, and what the Zoom webinar platform allows us to do is to record all of the information, all of the classes, and we put them up on a passworded site for, um, for the students with all of the tablature. And then Adam Larrabee, who I mentioned before, the master transcriber, goes in and transcribes a bunch of extra things that happened during the camps. So like we had Bela Fleck who came in with a little tablature at one of them, but he played like seven choruses of the jazz standard, all the things you are. And Bela went, mm -hmm. I mean, and Adam went in and transcribed all of that. And so that, wow. if you go and you watch Adam's, oh, you watch Bela's um, lesson and lecture, which mm -hmm. is question and answer mostly from faculty, as um, there's there's all the like he did four or five courses of Bill Cheatham and these kind of various like various ideas that he's um, that he displayed that Adam transcribed all these things and so we um, offer you can actually purchase access to the archive from the Banjo Summit site in our okay. store we have um, it kind of explains that but for a hundred dollars you um, you get just the class that Bela and Wes and Adam and these folks taught and, um, and then some of the transcriptions or else the handouts that they gave. And so you'll find that on the store on the site. But, yeah. Cool. I got to definitely check it out. Yeah. Um, There's a lot. Then... To it. I need to go check it out. I'm busy with like my <laughs> email and inbox. I'm like, Oh yeah, I need to go explore. <laughs> like Wes Corbett did a like fiddle tune request hour where we would just say, hey, can you play Gold Rush? And he'd take like four or five spins on Gold Rush and then talk about some of the techniques that he used. And it's just, it's pure gold, so. Awesome. So go up to banjo, banjosummit.org and, and, and find, search all of that out. Um, let's see. So while we come back in, backtracking, why don't you kind of give us a, a brief history of your where you came to be a musician, like what was your first instrument and how'd you get involved in playing the banjo and uh, a little background of yourself for people who don't sure. know you. Um, I, I was born in Texas and grew up in Maine and, or mostly in Maine. And then I went, to, I moved to the university, moved to Boulder for the University of Colorado and um, Colorado being this hotbed of bluegrass that's pretty exciting. and. When I was 20 years old, I went to the Telluride Bluegrass Festival and saw Strength in Numbers in the, I think it was the first year the Flectones were there and was incredibly inspired and came home and rented a cheap washboard banjo. And I studied with, uh, and got, took lessons from Mark Van, who was the original banjo player with Leftover Salmon. And so my ears, like I was getting lots of musical information that was not, or musical inspiration that was not bluegrass or traditional bluegrass. Hot Rise was playing around then and I, I got to see them some, but it was certainly more, um, more adventurous music that was happening around there. And so that, that turned me onto it and I, I kind of stuck with it and continued to study and found, um, my brother-in-law at the time was going to music, was going to composition school in Denver, and he was writing fugues and learning notation programs, and so I got to kind of see a different side of music education. And I took a, I took a music class at Naropa University, and have always kind of found um, musical inspiration and education from other sources besides just traditional bluegrass. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I fortunately, and at in 1997, I went to the Maryland Banjo Academy. This was a um, an event held, hosted by Banjo Newsletter, and Bela was there. Was kind of my big inspiration to go. And I met Jamie Stone there, who is a great, very open-minded banjo player who lived in Canada at that time. And uh, he was in kind of more of a modern jazz band, and we kept in touch. And I got I was incredibly inspired by Jamie's 
really wide open years listening to all sorts of ECM records and world music and African music. And in the days of MP3s, we would we would sit down and do a little white collar crime and trade a bunch of <laughs> a, bu a bunch of a bunch of MP3s back and forth. But I mean, it was the first I ever heard of Umu Sangari, the great um, right. Malian singer and people like that, that um, Jamie really turned me on to this whole other world of music and also the stuff that he was studying. So um, that's been because I didn't really growing up in Maine and like between Texas and Maine, they're not bluegrass hotbeds. And so I didn't have deep traditional um, roots that I came from. And I just kind yeah. of found my way through it and found my way back. I love playing that music, but uh, um, it, I kind of took a roundabout way to get there. Yeah, I, I kind of, I think I first became aware of you maybe when you put out your um, your album with the Bartok recording, mm -hmm. the Bartok tunes on it, and uh, um, that always struck. I was I was always a fan of Bartok, and I thought a lot of that stuff would work well because you know he plays a lot of folk um, right. melodies in his music and would work well as a uh, as a, in a string band arrangement. And then and then you did it, so it was, it was really interesting and. Um, it's a, and then all of your, all of your recordings. So there's, you know, I, I haven't heard one that's like a straight bluegrass recording. If you have one, you might have one. But uh, um, right. they're always very creative, and you're pulling from a lot of different, a lot of different sources, um, whether it be your own compositions or compositions of of somebody from more of the classical realm. Um, How did you yeah. kind of first come? come about that that path of, of you know really being having kind of you know a unique path with the banjo and acoustic music um i a, a really kind of inspirational moment for me or event was i went to the um, jazz and creative music workshop in banff canada it's this three-week mm -hmm. intensive um jazz workshop for all intents and purposes and i'm not a jazz guy I kind of happened into this thing it was um, it was recommended by my friend Jamie Stone he's like oh you would get a lot from this and I showed up and I felt like a fish out of water like it was it was um, it was a humbling event for sure but it really what I realized hanging around with those musicians is that when it comes down to it I really like being with and collaborating with string band musicians I also think that the string band is those, you know, the traditional five or six instruments sound really good together. While there's a lot of mid range and there's issues with it, it's just, it's a beautiful ensemble that's somewhat undeveloped. And um, so that was that, that time there really inspired me to come back and, and spend time working in string band settings. And so um, through that, as I explored composition a little bit and you know, discovered Bela Bartok who uh, was one of the world's first ethnomusicologists. He traveled around in rural Hungary and um, Hungary and Romania, and even down into North Africa, collecting collected over eight thousand folk tunes with a carrying around a gramophone, and uh, and he would transcribe those first by hand, but then they informed a lot of his music and, he, and a lot of the piano music and violin duos and the things that he wrote were. Um, either direct transcriptions of that. And my idea was like, well, what would a classically trained modernist classical composer, what would he do to a to Cherokee shuffle? Of right. which um, that was kind of my initial intention of examining it. And uh, Matt Flinner, who I've collaborated with a fair bit as well, had arranged a, a great um, a Romanian folk dance number one by Bartok for his string band of which we ended up putting on the record. But uh, I took that idea of like, why don't I write out chords and we could take solos and treat them more like new acoustic, new acoustic pieces and right. see where, so some things we played straight through and some things we would improvise on, but it was, um, I mean, what I learned is like, it's just bottomless. Like you, <laughs> that was what I took away from all that Bartok time is like you, I mean, it just there's so much you can do endlessly and that there's no reason we should be we don't have to play the same chords every time, every A, 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 B, B of um, 
Cherokee Shuffle, you could play one set of changes on the first A, a completely other set of changes on the second A, and then new changes on the B and the B. Like, and then you could do that again the next time around. And um, that's right. some of the things that Bartok would do, even though he didn't record or compose Cherokee Shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you kind of get from a place when you have a, a idea for, you know, kind of a loose idea, like, let's say, well, you heard some bar talk pieces and you're like, oh, that might work. But how do you get from that place to like, well, let's move forward with this idea and like make it happen? How, because um, it seems like you're good at that. Yeah. Uh, at... Oh, well, thank you. With that in particular, I mean, I went, it was pre Spotify. So I went on iTunes and I bought um, mountains and mountains of Bartok music. And what I found mostly, what I ended up listening to mostly was the solo piano music that seemed to be, it was easier to kind of ex, um, take solo piano music and expand it to a string band setting rather than taking a larger ensemble and condensing it into the string band felt like it might not be the direction I wanted to go with the music. So I listened to a ton of it. I bought a bunch of scores and would, um, I'm not, I'm a, I should just say like I'm a terrible reader, but it helps me under, you know, I, I, I'm not also, I'm not the best listener. I don't have the most amazing ears where I can hear exactly what's going on harmonically in a really out Bartok piece. And so that mm -hmm. would help me understand whether this was, this was a, um, a piece that had potential for us. And so things that caught my ear, I just listened and listened. And I used the program Sibelius quite a bit. And I would type things into Sibelius and listen and arrange and say like, oh, I think this could work and try and write out chords and then try and play with people. And uh, um, the musicians that I worked with were are such great collaborators. I, um, throughout that record, I worked a bunch with the Matt Flinner trio. And which is Matt Flinner on mandolin, Ross Martin on guitar, and Eric Tureen on the upright bass. And those guys have a project called Music Du Jour where they take, um, they write new music every single day that they're gonna play at that night at the show. So the morning of the show, they'll sit down and Ross will write one tune, Matt will write one tune, and Eric will write one tune, and then they premiere it that night at the show. But what they're really good at is able to take almost no musical information and make it sound like like something mm -hmm. and actually and really be supportive where we kind of in. So that, you know, I leaned on my collaborators quite a bit and just trust trusting them to um, to to bring themselves into it and working with good people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was the Bartok project. The. The next album that I made felt like the ne um, at least in my mind, was the next logical step was like, here's what here's what somebody from 100 years ago might do to a string band setting. What would a living composer do with the string band instruments? And so I made a record call Entwined where I hired living composers to write long form pieces for string band. And um, I worked with uh, it was four composers. One of them was Matt Flinner. He was kind of the inside, the man on the inside. But uh, a guy named Gian Riley, a really incredible guitarist from New York City, Mark Mellitz from uh, Chicago, and Matt McBain, who um, I think he I think he might be in New York. He might be in Southern California at this point. But um, and for that, in preparation, I just listened to tons and tons of of music. There's this great label called. Uh, New Amsterdam, which plays a lot of like what they call new music, like brand new, new composers, and just tried to dig in and listen to that music and be like, does this could I could I envision myself playing this music, and or something like that. And initially, I was inspired by Mark Mellitz, um, M E L L I T S, who has this you know really kind of dry. He writes what he call it's like minimalist rock, I guess would be <laughs> like it's it's Steve Reich meets kind of driving rock and roll but these like and it's he's a miniature miniaturist and so he'll have like one idea and it'll be like a minute and a half or like a two and a half minute movement and so he wrote this eight movement suite for us some of them really short just little little ideas so that was um that was the idea behind 
that was the germ of the idea behind that record. And, um, and, and so when they give you, you know, when these composers write something, are you then kind of arranging it for the string band? What is your mark that you're putting on it then? Well, they're, they're writing for, um, they're writing for these five instruments. And so right, I would receive right, right. a Sibelius file and, you know, in talking with them beforehand, I was super clear of like, you know, some people in this group can read and some of us can't really read that well being me. Um, you know, we're going to need, we're going to need time in advance. And like, we're not, this is not like handing music to a string quartet that could just read right. anything down. And so talk with them about the range of the instruments, have send them a bunch of kind of modern, um, inventive progressive bluegrass, things like Punch Brothers for them to get a sense of like, here's, it doesn't all have to sound like flattened scrubs, though right. that's also good to hear of like, this is how this, these five, six instruments work together. Um, so they would send us charts and I would just ba basically break, break them apart and send out people's parts and we would get, get together and rehearse as much as we could. And then, um, and, and then we premiered it. We would do like a world premiere and the composer would come in for the world premiere. We were doing these in Boulder, Colorado. And so the composer would work with us for a couple few days to get it, to get it together. And then we played it and then we went in the studio basically the next day and would record it. So you'd pre kind of premiere like th those, those like however many songs that composer gave you, four or five songs that tunes that they, um, at that time and then you record exactly. that or you like record... so with with the mark mallets show for example um we got up we played like a full set of music music composed by everybody more like adventurous string band music things that i wrote mm -hmm. and uh, things that um, everybody kind of contributed pieces it would take a set break come back mark mallets got up introduced the piece and then we played then we play those um play that and then play another couple tunes. But yeah. that was kind of the, the structure of it. And then they would be there for um, some portion of the time in the studio just to, right. to, to dial it in. And uh, I mean, some of the stuff was just incredibly hard. I never, I never got <laughs> totally lost in the premiere, but I, we did a like dress rehearsal concert for the Matt McBain thing. And I mean, I like, I could the slow movement like I was just completely lost. I'm playing without picks and I can't remember it very well. It's like all these harmonics and I just couldn't hear the um, hear the whole. Like I right. just I'm not experienced with that and like there was no recording to practice with. Like we're, right, right. we're trying to kind of piece this You're together. Creating but, it. but um but everybody had ex I mean I worked um, in the the violinist, especially that I work with, which is Enyan Peltatiller and Ryan Dricky on that project. And both of them have worked in orchestras and all sorts of lots of classical music. And then Matt Flinner worked in the he was in the Modern Mandolin Quartet. And um, I mean, every everybody but me essentially <laughs> had a lot had more experience kind of in that setting. And uh, I guess I was a quick learner. And, um, well, it's a fantastic record. As it's, it's oh, thanks very much. It's, it's a great concept, and it's a, yeah, it sounds fantastic. So definitely check it out, everybody. Entwined. Um, it's I'm the Jake Shep the, Quartet. Is it under? It I was think the Jake, it was Quint. It was all Quintet. Jake Shep's Quintet. quintet. It's called quintet. Entwined, and uh, I mean, it's a ton of music. It's like a seventy-minute disc. But if um, the final tune on the record, which is pretty abstract, um, I don't want to say it's abstract. Like it's, that's the one by Guion Riley. It's a single like seven and a half minute piece. But the intro was, um, the intro is incredible and it's worth listening to. And just to give you, it might help when listening to it. It's like, it's in 15, eight. Um, so it was like a measure of four and then a measure of seven. But right. the entire thing like triples in speed. It starts incredibly slow. We're all playing percussive parts on our instruments. and. And so Guillaume basically conducted us in the studio as we sped up to get to performance speed of the, um, it was fun. It was a lot. It was, yeah, yeah. it was quite a project. I am proud of that project. It's, 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 it's very cool. Do you want to play something, uh, something sure. for us? Yeah. 
I'm gonna play um I've um I love Brazilian choro music is this traditional mm -hmm. music from I, I shouldn't say traditional but like uh, about a century ago this music formed in Rio in the streets of Rio so it's like an urban folk music and uh, um, I just it's mostly it's mostly mandolin driven banjo is not traditional music, but I've learned a handful of the tunes and I'm gonna, I'll try one here this one's called Pedicinos do Seu sorry for my Portuguese pronunciation. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, I, lo I love that. I love that music. I used to play uh, a lot of those tunes in a band oh, on cool. guitar, most of that. but uh, uh -huh. I never really learned. I was playing mostly uh, court, most of the harmony. Um, the melodies yeah. are, are, are um, there's, you know, there's a lot going on that, you know, they're <laughs> longer form than, than a, like a fiddle tune and, uh, but, but very such strong melodies. Yeah. I feel like there is some, uh, there's some symbiosis in some way with with fiddle tune music, like not exactly right. like it takes turns that are un, unexpected. But one of the things like that tune in particular was composed by a great cavaquinho player, which is the ancestor of the ukulele. So it looks like a ukulele. It's with steel strings, but it's tuned like a banjo. It's tuned. Um, it's four strings. It's D G B D, um, but half as long it's just these four strings and wow. so a lot of the cavaquinho tunes actually lay out really well on banjo um right and right. that's what like that one that one is i i drew from classical guitar range like i kind of drew from a bunch of different arrangements but uh there's one um i haven't played it in a while <laughs> Uh, 
something like that. That's that one's called Karyokinia. Mm -hmm. um, it's been they all for me. They all I have to review them all before I like go to a jam. They don't stick with me as much as Saint Anne's Real might. But uh, <laughs> but Karyokinia. I mean, it's just all right there. Some of them have weird ideas that you would never think of on banjo that you know that Earl Scruggs didn't play or. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they they off sometimes there's like lots of range things because they're only they're right here. But uh, mm -hmm. all the chord, like if you just want, I mean, someday I'll get a cavaquinho because I already know all the chords and then I can right. just strum along. Right, right. Um, Have you tried doing much of the rhythmic? Because there's that that rhythmic, the common rhythmic um, folds of, of shore music. Um, sure. Try doing um, that at all with the three fingers. I've done it on tenor pain. Yeah. Like, just like comping for it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I, I'm trying to think how, I would say like I, d I haven't developed a banjo way of doing it. I, I feel like yeah. I'm somewhere in between the cavaquinho and just what a banjo might do. Um, right. But it's really like the most challenging thing is getting the rhythms in you. Um, right. These samba rhythms are, a lot of it happens really offbeat. I took Definitely. a lesson from a great mandolin player and he suggested, he's like, you just have to go learn the percussion parts. And so I joined a Bateria in Boulder, which is a large, like Brazilian percussion ensemble. Yeah. And I played mostly just bell because, and uh, would just work on these things, but they all start in the offbeat and like trying to find the one is, is pretty, pretty fun to kind of groove on those. And so that, um, but uh, let me think. Uh, That's kind of a basic samba rhythm and then on some tunes they will turn it around it'll be what they i don't even know if they have a name for it but it's called the anticipated samba so that's like a two bar pattern that they switch the two bars and this is what's especially hard for gringo and i should also just say i probably play all this music with an incredible accent of being a boulder based banjo player rather than a a, a Brazilian, a, a, yeah, a, Bra a Brazilian a cavaquinho player, but um, the uh, so if you were to do that, same so to turn it around, the way what I do to turn it around, if you're going to get into this, is I will actually play like four downbeats, um and then start that pattern. So to basically trick myself into doing it. So I'd go like, uh, it, it doesn't make total sense without kind of all the rest of the without everything else and without yeah. everything else. So I'm not sure I'm doing the best job at explaining it, but it's um, easy to turn the beat around. Definitely. It really is. And, uh, yeah. But what, I mean, back to this, this Shuro Summit camp that I want to run, like my experience yeah. with this stuff is like the, the barrier to entry is pretty high. Like you have to have a lot of technique. These parts, the tunes are really long. They're three parts and there's all sorts of like jazz harmony chords. And, and then when people solo on top of them and have freedom with these melodies, um, there's a lot going on, but it just takes, you just need to jam this to just jam it over and over and over again with other people who love it. People who don't mm -hmm. love it, you, you're like, hey, let's play this tune. And you pull out this like three page chart of like re with all these that's covered in black 16th notes with really dissonant chords and all these walking bass lines. And like, it's not fun for unless it's unless it's really fun, right. for you, which I guess is right. true for for most things in the world. But uh, so. So is the shore camp for all instruments or is it a banjo related? Oh, it would thing? be mostly for shore. Um, like it's, there are other people who play shore on banjo, but I haven't, I haven't met very yeah. many of them. And uh, it's really, it would be an all instrument camp okay. and mostly, gotcha. you know, attract seven string guitar and mandolin and clarinet mm -hmm. and um, yeah, things like that. So okay. is, 
it's still in the nascent stages, but um, it's the host band would be this, um, it's called Grupo Falso Baiano from San Francisco. Is a great, there, um, I think we may have one Brazilian that would be on faculty, but mostly gringos. So kind of a good element of, um, of translation from them, of these gringos right. who, who actually speak with far less of an accent than I do <laughs> when it comes right. to playing this music. And uh, it would just, we would um, build the schedule around spending as much time in small, realistic ensembles, like you might be playing, like performing this with three or four or five people and just workshopping these tunes to, to no end, just to, just to get a chance to really get inside of them. Because each one is its own world um, there's crossover information just like fiddle tunes, but like, you know, on banjo, the difference between St. Anne's Reel and Blackberry Blossom, like they're related, but they're also different projects on banjo. And um, so you could spend a long time dissecting and really getting into St. Anne's Reel. Um, mm -hmm. I, I went to a lecture from Chris Thiele that, I mean, he spent almost an hour talking about St. Anne's Reel, maybe 30 <laughs> minutes, but a yeah. long time talking about how why he thinks it's the most beautiful kind of perfect fiddle tune. So as only Chris well, that, that can do. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, come moving on. Uh, you had a music, subs another, you know, interesting thing you had going on was, <laughs> was you had a music subscription series called round window, right? I, I did. Um, the, yeah. The original, it, it, Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, go. You. you talk about it because what oh. was the idea of here? Because it's not. It's, it doesn't. It, it's not existing yeah. anymore. Yeah. Right? Um, Bandcamp. I think they still do this. They have a subs They had a subscription platform within uh, Bandcamp. Is an alternative place to sell music, and lots of artists post their stuff, and you can buy it more straight from the artist if you're going to buy music, and you can either keep it within the Bandcamp app and stream it or download it. They offered a subscription service for three dollars and up per month um, that you could subscribe to an artist. I guess it was maybe similar to Patreon. I have never set up a Patreon mm -hmm. account, but it was before I'd heard of Patreon or in the very earliest days of Patreon. But uh, my idea was to do um, a once a month release with different collaborators. And so I'd go in this, I spent like you know, a day in the studio with the Matt Flinner trio, who is my favorite band. We record a few tunes and then I went, I, did, I recorded a lot of Shoro. I kind of had a Shoro band when I was living in Colorado and um, go and spend a day in the studio with them and various on time with like a couple, my favorite Irish duo that lived in Boulder. And these would basically be interspersed. So one week, one month would be this Irish set and then the next month would be a Shoro tune. And then another would be this, you know, weird classical piece that I arranged. And, um, and it was great. I ran it for three years. We did 36 releases and um, it was, I learned a ton. You would get tablature with it and, um, and kind of liner, extensive liner notes, which have seemed to kind of disappear in this day and age of Spotify. And I would write up things about the music, but uh, in the end, people don't really want to pay for music anymore. I had a bunch of subscribers and I'm so grateful for the 50 subscribers that I had, but uh, it just, it was time to, yeah, time yeah. to do something else. And so I, I snatched, it was called the round window, round window radio. And I snatched the round window name, which I really liked and uh, moved that to the round window Institute. Gotcha. And but people could still go find a lot of this these tunes on. Uh, did you say SoundCloud? I believe. Um, no, uh, there there's a handful. If you search Round Window Radio on Spotify, I released five or six tunes, and I actually have them all. Everything we did, I have mastered. I just have yet to release it. I've been um, busy with. With uh, you're busy and, with a lot, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> busy with life and other things, and so I have yet to um, get back. But so a handful of them are out, and I actually like. Um, so at some point they they will come, but when I find the bandwidth to promote to promote all those things, and like 
the way music when it, it comes if it's fresh to you you're like oh god this is so exciting but i've heard it and I'm so, have been sick of it for five years already that it's hard for me to get excited to say come check out my stuff that's right, right. just to be to be honest another interesting project that you did was you um you scored a silent movie uh, it was a buster keaton silent movie an old, old silent movie and uh, what was the inspiration for doing that the, again you're you know you you know you're just going you know these the all that the link is that there's all very creative you know interesting you know outputs uh, you know you aren't just going out and playing a tune right um well thank you and the Part of that back to the jazz and creative music workshop that I went to, it yeah. was run by this great trumpet player named Dave Douglas. And yeah. at that time, Dave Douglas was touring his Keystone project, which was playing soundtracks to um, Fatty Arbuckle films. And uh, and at that time, you know, at that time, it was a very introspective kind of musical time being up there. And uh, I wrote out essentially like a 10 year plan for myself of goals that I wanted to do. And one was to score, score a silent film. And, and eventually, um, and then I would go, I would kind of go see, I listened a lot to Bill Frizzell, who's did, um, he scored some Buster Keaton films and, and, and then, um, I met a friend, um, Dave Keenan, who's a great banjo player who lives in the Northwest. And he's written some films and or written some scores for silent films. And he basically said, he's like, you just got to do it. And then the get like, once you do it, then something will happen. Nobody will ever ask you to do it unless you, I mean, maybe that stuff comes yeah. to people and certain people. But now that for like, for example, Bill Frizzell is probably asked to write a lot more silent film scores now that he's done it. Sure. And so my inspiration was much more Frizzellian than, um, if that's if that's an actually yeah. adjective, um, <laughs> I understand it. <laughs> and, uh, then to kind of directly reference, um, it wasn't to make period music from 1921. I think was when the Scarecrow was made, but it was to. Um, so I challenged myself to write a score that would work for string band, but also for other ensembles. And I was playing with this group at that time that was the Shoro Band plus bass. It was that I called the Round Window. I think just Round Window was the name of the band. Um, sure a round window review, but uh, that was like electric guitar, bass, percussion, violin, and banjo. And so I wrote it for that ensemble, but thinking ahead of like, could I play this with string band? And uh, and it, it was a, it was a really fun exercise. I spent I spent a lot of time watching a lot of Buster Keaton films and, and he did a lot that were 20 minutes and a lot that were one hour. That seemed to be the format from when he was active in the silent days and um, writing one hour of music out the gates felt like pretty ambitious. So I went for 20, mu 20 minutes, one of these 20 minute films, tried to screen away any ones that had, some of them have some racist content that I wanted to avoid and, uh, and not do the films that Frizzell had, you know, that, that you know, try and find some some more maybe I don't want to say obscure because Buster Keaton fans know all this stuff, but they were more obscure for me. And then I sat. I remember sitting on. The, I would sit on the plane, watching the movie. I had a silent version of the movie that I downloaded, and I put my iPod on shuffle and just listened to tons and tons of music over while watching the movie to see what worked and what didn't. And um, all sorts of things worked. It was kind of mm -hmm. amazing once you. Once you remove the like, kind of period ragtime or the improvised piano stuff, um, and uh, so I I kind of broke down the scenes that I wanted to and and wrote some themes and had some tunes that I felt like were strong enough that I could that I could tear apart and um, make into a make into a thing, make yeah. into a score. And so we played it a couple times in Colorado and then. I was invited by my good friend Luis Gomez, who lives in Barcelona. He's about to run his the twentieth annual Al Ras Bluegrass Festival in Barcelona. And Luis and I met many, many years ago in Boulder at the Pete Wernick Banjo Camp. 
and have stayed friends. I've stayed at his place. He's he's just a wonderful human being and, and good dear friend. And um, he invited me to come play at um, at Al Raz. And so I had a lot of extra. I had a bunch of frequent flyer miles. I flew in Joe Desposito, a great fiddler, and Mike Robinson, a guitarist, and we used Luis's wife, um, Maribel, on bass and played it in in Spain. And, um, and, That's awesome. and it, it went over really well. I had no idea how a, um, how a Barcelona audience might respond to Buster Keaton, but I mean, Buster, I, like that's tribute to Buster Keaton's genius is that it's funny no matter what. And, um, and so there is, I think the link will probably show up somewhere, but um, there's a video of us playing that from, um, from Al Ras that they filmed the whole thing, kind of a static view of us that you can, that you can find on YouTube. I hope, cool. I hope to write more and I hope to play it again at some point. I've just been, um, I moved to Vermont just a couple of years ago and have been busy with Banjo Summit and some other, other projects and it hasn't come back around to, to getting in the silent film world. So you kind of touched on this a little bit ago when you talked about somebody said, just should I, should I do this? And somebody at the, the, the band camp said, uh, you know, you just have to do it. Um, but how would, what's the advice for, for somebody, an artist that has a loose idea for some, you know, creative, creative concept of some kind, but nobody's really asking you for this. There may not be a big monetary payoff in it, but there's an artistic payoff in it and you want to do it. What's, what's the advice to get that, an artist over the hump to to act on it and not just keep having these little loose crazy ideas and then let life to come take over yeah i mean that's a good question um you know some of my musical um yeah my my heroes like bela fleck is a hero to too many and his africa project i mean he spent Hundred, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to make that project happen, and um, it was it was his. Nobody was asking him to go to Africa, and I don't think that you know it's like um, it, I don't want to I don't want to compare myself to Bela, and I don't want to think that we. And I, don't, I think that's a dangerous road to go down to compare yourself to somebody who has this magnificent. Be like I'm going to write a. A concerto for banjo, but if you want to write a concerto for banjo, there are symphonies for hire that you can go and get it played and get it recorded. Like you can make all of this stuff happen. The idea that it's going to pay for itself is that you're going to make money from it. I think you kind of have to let go of that. My um, my friend Gian Riley, who I mentioned, he wrote the, um, the it's called Stumble Smooth, that tune that's in 15 that I mentioned from the Entwined record. Guillaume said it so clearly, he's like, when I, lead, when I lead gigs, I lose money. If I'm a side man, I make money. Like he said it very clearly of like, this is just how the New York world works is where, <laughs> where he is. And I don't think that's always true for, obviously it's not always true for every ensemble, but I think, um, I, I don't find that many, you know, talking about money, Artists seldom talk about money, you know, what it's like to be a side man or how, how all this works. Do you pay people to rehearse? Do you pay people for to be how all of that works is somewhat opaque. But what I know is, um, is yeah, the, I mean, that that help, like ha that really incredible artists end up losing money on big grand gigs because the gig is more important than than the and like prioritizing the art and so just mm -hmm. jumping in and doing it and say I'm okay I'm going to fly in these people or I'm going to pay these folks like I want to I want to make this happen here here would be one other example just speaking personally I want to make a Shoro record at some point and I've written a handful of these tunes and I played a gig um, at a cafe in Rock at um, at cafe near Rocky Grass this summer mm -hmm. it's like a little it's called the Stone Cup. We did like a morning breakfast gig there. 
And I just said, I knew I was going to make no money, but I want to play all of this music with people. And like I was saying, that music is so important to jam a bunch. And these folks are great. And the imp, once you get have to stand up and perform it, it's that much more, you have to be that much more prepared. And so I just, I paid, you know, the, the round window band that I mentioned before, I just said, all right, I'll pay, like, I'll pay you guys to come play this gig. We're not going to split what we get in the tip jar, but, and so, you know, when you go and you watch, you go see these things as a fan, you don't, you don't see that part. That's kind of the underbelly, but it is a vital, um, it is how the, it is how the world works, especially with great full-time musicians. Like these mm -hmm. folks need to be paid. And if they weren't doing this, if they're doing your gig for tip jar, they might be losing money because they're not playing their regular, um, well-paid jazz standard gig or something like that. Sure. So does, does this all make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's definitely good advice. Cause I, I, I think, you know, a lot of people struggle with this. A lot of artists struggle with this question. You know, should I, should I create, do this, follow down this project, even though there's no, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no like real end game on a, on a business level. Um, but there might be, but that's, that's not the reason for it. Should I just do it because I want to do it and I have a passion for this, uh, creating this, especially when you're doing original music during, you know, creative projects, um, yeah. like you've been involved in. I mean, you, I think you need to, I, or I think teasing apart, you know, what like musical ambition with just general ambition, um, like business ambition of like, I'm mm -hmm. going to, I need to make a lot of money. But, um, and often with a lot of these people, like they're tied together for some of the big famous artists that we know, but just having musical ambition, like the Entwined Project was never going to be a million seller. Right, it was, right. it was, <laughs> it was just total, like, I want to, I want to, I love collaborating with other musicians and working on challenging music. And I'm, I feel fortunate. I work with a lot of musicians who I feel are a, a lot better musicians than me, but here's this setting that we're all kind of challenged in this way together. That is this fun, um, collaborate or it was challenging, but fun for, I chose people who I thought would be, who enjoy being challenged. Not everybody does, but, um, I feel like this is a bit of a circuitous way to get at your initial question, but I think just not being afraid to pay people to play with them. It's not, I don't think I'm continuously shocked at, to find out like, Oh wow, you actually paid that person to rehearse this piece with you. Like, yeah, then. then but, but what about even less paying people to play with you about what, you know, the world does the world really need? at least in my head, sometimes I'm, I said, does the world really need this thing? That, I mean, no, this thing that I want to make, but you know, nobody's asking for it, but I want to make it. And, uh, I mean, you know, I should I go forward and with this project or should I just, you know, let this idea of this to kind of evaporate? I mean, we'll go into any art museum. Like right. th those, those are like, especially some of these modern artists that create these like extraordinary, crazy things. Like, I mean, I went in, I saw like, they made a giant clay log that filled this room at this art museum. I went into Chicago, like that person had a vision, like this thing's not for sale. Nobody really wants to buy it. It can't be outdoors. The world doesn't need that, but the world needs art in other, in right. other ways. Like you just like, um, yeah, but I, I, I like it kind of gets back to just, I mean, you have to, you have to pursue that, that muse in some way. And, um, it's not true for, it's not true for everybody. And there's a lot of people like at some level, you also have to pay the bills and, right. um, but, and you can do, do those things on the side. And there are, we all have these models of people who have continually, Put that out front like and back to bela fleck i mean he continuously just said i'm going i want to play like he worked and worked and worked and worked with the fleck tones to make that accepted but it's it was pushing a rock uphill mm -hmm. um, and uh in the this is i'm going to quote um 
Joan Rivers from from <laughs> some show I saw her on, but she, she basically said like describing comedy career of like you push a rock uphill and then you die. And so nobody is tr like there's just not enough space. And so you just have to you just just continually try and kind of do it and pursuing. And I think even that comes back down to like, I mean, I feel like we've talked a lot about these more advanced like advanced ideas of playing playing music in ensembles and stuff where it requires a lot of musicianship and technique. But I think going back to the impetus for Banjo Summit of, I mean, I would say for me, one of the first tunes I learned on banjo was Sunset Road. I, that was the first tune I ever transcribed. I didn't do it, the Bela Fleck tune. I didn't transcribe it accurately, but that's what was catching my ear. And I worked on the um, Sea Rock City. <laughs> That, I mean, that's not Cripple Creek, like one of the tunes that they normally start you on, but I, I started with those things because that's what kept me playing. And I feel like what's nice about the Banjo Summit is this smorgasbord of like, if you're interested in deep jazz harmony, you don't have to be an amazing musician to love that. Lots of non-musicians love deep jazz harmony, and, and uh, but you can go and work on that. And if that keeps you mentally engaged, um, that's, that's good. Like it's all good. I think all practice is global and that just keeping you working on and following a muse and following through and trying to do it well and practicing this stuff. So it's musical is important, but I think that, um, if you take a sidetrack and be like, I'm going to work on Django Reinhardt, or I'm going to work on be to be as much like JD Crow as I can be, or now I'm going to transcribe these Bela Fleck tunes off the new record and try and get those in my fingers. Or now I'm going to spend time on Adam Larrabee's preludes, even though I can't play it very well. Um, I feel like all of that is all of that is good and keeps you going. Just like if you know, if you were going to learn to paint, I think I, I've I have not found the like space in my life to learn how to paint, but I would just <laughs> buy some I'd want to and buy a bunch of materials and buy a bunch of canvases and just go like go make noise so to speak and see what happens yeah. and see what comes out and um eventually hopefully develop technique i don't know if that's the best yeah that's fantastic play. i mean um we have to have one question before we kind of oh, sure. i want to wrap start to wrap it up um uh this is from dennis mustang he's saying what would you say a total beginner should focus on in the beginning looking back from your own experience in terms of handling the banjo and practice in terms of um, handling the banjo practice um i th i think it's um i would say i would say a couple things like i think it is important to play like with picks on and your banjo not muted like it sounds, it's going to sound bad, but stuffing the banjo with a t-shirt in it or playing without picks because you're going to wake up your roommates, um, it changes your technique. And it's not, I think just trying to, in order to sound good, you have to sound bad. And that's true for, you know, in so many media. Um, and so having, having, having trust in that of like, I'm going to sound bad before I'm going to sound good. And that actually just trying to um yeah focusing on you like trying to make make a sound that is an accurate banjo like getting the picks on the strings the picks getting the picks going with with strings is really hard to kind of develop that technique but starting if that's the style of music that you want to play is with three finger picks then um that's what i would recommend that's one Thing. Good advice. Well, Jake, you're um, you're incredibly inspiring uh, uh, to myself, and I know many others. Um, all your you know all, all your different avenues and, and different ways you're pursuing you know playing the banjo, and then also all these other your whole rock uh, round window. Uh, the, the, I forget the name. Sorry, exactly the press and and the uh, <laughs> the different versions of Round Window um, of everything you're doing is, is is great. The Banjo Summit, the tabs. So uh, keep it up. 
um but uh do you want to play a tune play us out and uh sure um let's see if i can get through this um this is a tune that i learned from the wes corbett um the wes corbett book which should be out we're taking pre-orders at banjosummit.org but uh it's the Wes Corbett Cascade album is totally beautiful. Wes is one of my favorite banjo players um, and just an incredible human being and musician and banjo player, just his technique. And so I'm going to play, I'll play the Mary Evelyn. So thanks so much for having me. Very, what a just treat. And thank you all in YouTube world for listening.